Happy Sabbath. It's another blessed Sabbath day. We are overjoyed that we are in the rest of God. This morning, we want to thank you for tuning in to our service. And we want to assure you that you are going to have a great experience in the Lord. You are going to have an in-depth about school this morning, followed by the children's corner, which their children love so much. Then we'll have a sermon by Pastor T.K. Mensah. You don't want to miss it. Please stay tuned. Share the link with others, your friends, loved ones, so that they can join you in worship. God richly bless you and stay tuned. Once again, another Sabbath is here with us, and we have come to Sabbath School. We want to invite you to join us as we study God's Word. Invite your relatives to be with you as we study in your living room or your bedroom, 
and we pray that God will give us an understanding of his word. Shall we bow in prayer? Heavenly Father, once again we have come before your throne of grace, thanking you for your love and kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for the opportunity to be here again to study your word. We pray, O oh Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide us and lead us through your word. And at the end, may we be wiser unto salvation. We thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' name have we prayed. Amen. 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 So lesson number three, Jesus and the Apostles' view of the Bible. That is the lesson for this morning. Jesus and the Apostles' view of the Bible. The memory text is taken from Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, Elder, will you please read it to us? But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. Matthew 4, 4. Amen. Amen. Uh, we are living in the, the postmodern age. And it seems to me that the Bible has been largely interpreted, reinterpreted through the lens of philosophy that questions both its inspiration and its authority. In fact, the Bible is seen as merely a good book of human ideas, you know, and uh, living, uh, human beings who lived in relatively primitive cultures who couldn't possibly understand the issues that we are facing today. See? And as a result concern. of this, for many, the Bible has become largely irrelevant in our age. In this Darwinian, Darwinian thinking and modern philosophy. However, we completely reject that position as Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. Instead, in the New Testament, we can see the inspired way to view this entire scripture by studying how Jesus applied scripture in his own life and how the apostles also applied scripture. So, let's delve quickly into this. Let's look at Jesus. Let's travel with Jesus to the Mount of uh, how do you call it? the Wilderness. After fasting 40 days and was hungry, he was taken by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. Let's see the conversation between him or, the, or, or Satan and how Jesus responded to all the uh, messages from Satan with scripture. So we'll be focusing more on Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 to 11. Now when Christ was tempted by appetite, right. Satan said, if you are the son of God, he knows that he was hungry. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. What was the response from Christ? It is written. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. I think the focus here is, it is written. It is written. And what is written? Jesus is referencing the Bible, yes. the scriptures. So when he says it is written, he is talking about what is written in God's word. Right. 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 So that's the scriptures. And, and, and he was exactly quoting from the scripture. Yes, yeah. when he said, man shall not live by bread alone. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Okay. He quoted exactly from the scripture. And it is important that Christians, we don't add to the word, we don't subtract to the word, but we quote exactly, exactly. verbatim, yeah. as it is written. Yes. So when he said, it is written, he was reading what is written. Yes. Not something he conjured in his mind. Yeah. Yes. And that, that shows that he... Dependent. He depended on the word of God. He exactly. trusts in God's word. Yes. And again, when he was tempted with the world's the kingdoms and glories, he responds, it is written. It is written once more. And what did he say to that? He says, you shall worship the Lord Thy your God. Lord, and him only shall thou serve. Amen. Yes. And that one to his quoting scripture. Am I right? Yes. yes. Very good. Yes. He points right back 
to the living word. That's right. So here we can see that Christ reminds us that true worship is focused on God and not anyone else. Right. And that submission to his word is true worship. Right. And uh, as contemporary people, people living in contemporary times, who feel that the word of God is no, le- no longer relevant, Christ is helping us to understand that even in today's time, his word is relevant. If we want to worship him in spirit and in truth, then we must worship him according to his word. Yes, in every circumstance we find ourselves, there is an answer to our circumstance in the word of God. Whether it be sickness, whether it be a coronavirus pandemic, whether it is poverty, whether it is a sin situation, there are answers in the word of God and we need to refer to it. And especially in our spiritual growth, if we can grow, in addition to being prayerful, we should feed on the word of God. This is what can make us grow spiritually. Okay. Now, and let's Jesus, look at, before you come in, let's look at the last, the last uh, uh, temptation from Satan. The second With actually. a temptation of the love of display and on presumption. Yes. That, that was actually the second but illustrated as the third here. Okay. And so now, Jesus uh, replies, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yes. And thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That one too is also quoting some scripture. Yes. Yes. But let us note something here. You see, what Satan said is also in scripture. Is it? Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, so, he, he's so crafty. Okay. Mm-hmm. He wanted to use scripture too. So it means that we can misapply scripture. scripture. Definitely. Misapply? And people say that, well, Solomon married so many women, so what is wrong with us also marrying so many women? <laughs> uh, you also remember where people quote saying, oh, drink a little wine for your stomach. stomach's sake. Right. Uh, they quote in scripture, right? Yes, they are. They are. <laughs> but you Out can misapply. Out of context. Yeah. You know, you can misapply, and, and, and that's how the devil works. Okay. You know, he, he deceives. You know, using the right words, but at the wrong time. That's right. And, and you see, um, this particular uh, temptation speaks to um, our love for display, our love for showmanship, right. doing things that others may see. Hypocrisy. Our God does not perform any of his miracles to satisfy human curiosity, no. but he does it out of absolute necessity. And so when and a pastor... so that God may be glorified. glorified. So when a pastor takes um, his uh, whatever, scepter and all, and goes to a zoo and says that he's going to play Daniel, when there is no need for that, you are just, you know, offering yourself as a meal for those lions. Right. I don't get it. <laughs> that is the law for showmanship. It makes no sense. It does not make any spiritual or even physical sense. I mean, why, why don't you reserve whatever you think you have till you actually need it? You are in a corner and then God will come and deliver you. Why do you tempt God? It right. is written, thou shalt not tempt That's right. the Lord now, thy in all, God. In all three temptations, Jesus responds with the word, with the statement, it is, it is written. That is, Jesus goes right to the word of God and nothing else to deal with the attacks and deceptions of Satan. Just like you said earlier. So whatever response we should also give to any query must come from scripture. Yeah, what Jesus did yes. is saying that it is not everything that you need to pray about. It is not. Need, the fact is wisdom. that you have read the word of God. Mm-hmm. Apply it. Apply mm-hmm. it. And so it. then the Bible and the Bible, Bible alone, alone yes. should be the ultimate standard and foundation of to our belief. To defeat the yeah. enemy. Yeah. Yes. Because the devil knows what is written. <laughs> he does. And for him to quote it, he knows what is written. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people that we interface with, they somehow know what is written, but maybe the understanding is not as much as what we have. And that is why if 
as Adventists, we can just submit to divine authority, read, ask to understand, invite the Holy Spirit, and we understand to be able to, you know, explain to those out there. I think this message will go farther and wider than it's going now. Right now it's spooling, and that's because we're not reading, we're not applying scripture. We're even shy because those that are supposedly in error, they quote more scriptures than those of us that are in the right. So, it's, it's, it worries me, seriously. All right. Now, the Bible, and the Bible alone was Jesus' method of defense against the attacks of the adversary. You know. Now, Jesus is God. But in his defense against Satan, he submits himself solely to the word of God. And that is beautiful. If Jesus himself would submit to the word of God solely, how about you? How it, about you? It authenticates the, yes. the scriptures. Yes, by so doing, he has already authenticated, authenticated. It, giving us the right that we must also do likewise. Now, the writer says in, in, it is not opinion. It is not an elaborate, convoluted argument. It is not with words of personal animosity. It is instead by the simple yet profound words of scripture. For Christ, scripture has the greatest authority and the greatest power. In this way, his ministry begins with a certain foundation and continues to build upon the trustworthiness of the Bible. So, as uh, Martin Luther would say, sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible, and the Bible alone. only or alone. Let's move on to the next lesson. Jesus and the law. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 and read from verse 17 to 20. I read. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Okay. Matthew 22, verse 29. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Okay. You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And the power of God is in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. right. Am I right? Yes. Very good. Now, Jesus told his disciples to be obedient to the word of God and to the law. Yes. And I, I, I am pleased with what he said about the fact that he didn't come to change the law, the prophet. And he says, it is even easy for heaven and earth to pass away than for Before a job or a tittle to be taken away from the, it, it, the it is It is very strange how people say that um, the commandments of God have been nailed to the cross. It is very strange. In, in, in truth, if anybody came to even expand on the law, it was Christ. Christ. That's what scripture says. It actually no. says he will magnify the, the law, law because, and make it honorable. Because, for instance, the law says, thou shalt not kill. Jesus says, if you tell your friend or a brother, Raka, you have already killed. With your mouth. And if you look at a woman and say, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you look at a woman lustfully, which is, which is more difficult to do, mm -hmm. to look at a woman lustfully or to really get a woman to bed, which one is more, more, more easy to, to do? The it's one. the lustful one. And many people are into it. And he says, you have already committed adultery. Yeah. Even before you brought the person into bed. Mm -hmm. So, who is saying that he came to make the law any easier? <laughs> no, but he himself, he says, he said, I, he came, I, to I, came, I it. came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill. fulfill it. No, beside the fulfilling, <laughs> he said he came to make things much difficult. He's yes. going to pit father, father against, against children. Yes. children. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think it all uh, hinges around the understanding of the Bible. No, we just want to choose uh, what we want. 
you know, if it, if it pleases us, we choose it. If it doesn't, no. Yeah, we it, find a reason exactly. yeah, to, you know, shelve it. But, that's, but that's whether we happening. like it or not, the God is going God. to judge this world based on his law. On exactly. His law. That's right. And based now, on the truth that we have been exposed to. That's right. Now, we also notice that there is never a hint of Jesus ever doubting the authority or relevance of the scripture. No. On the contrary, he constantly referred to it when he even says, what is written in it? And to the Sadducees, he says, you are wrong because, <laughs> because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus taught that a mere intellectual knowledge of the Bible and his teachings was insufficient That's true. for knowing truth and more important for knowing the Lord who is the truth. Something worries me here. Yeah. So um, can we say that we are in error today, children of God. We are led into error because we do not know the scriptures. Yes. We are led into so many kinds of errors, whether it's interpersonal relationship, our relationship with God, the vertical one, whatever it is, we're yes, led but, into but errors because we don't know the said. scripture. That's what Christ said in Matthew 22, verse 29, which you, you read. He says, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures and nor the power of God. And note, he didn't say you have not read. Jesus did not say you have not have been not reading. Read. He said you, you don't do not know, know, which means you don't have a relationship. It eludes you. You, you read know? it as a story. Exactly. It eludes you. Yeah. you. You have no relationship. Maybe only intellectual. That is accent. it. We are not getting the point. Yeah. The Nebuchadnezzar syndrome. All right. Now, let's see wow. if we go to Matthew 22 from 37 to 40. Uh, Jesus tells the view of the law of Moses. Mm. Uh, should I read? Um, um, maybe well, for want of summary, time. In summary, he's saying yes. that um, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. This yeah. is a summary Good. of the law and the prophets. Yes. They all hinge on this. Yes. Yes. And when you take the Ten Commandments, the first four is the human, divine human relationship. The vertical. The vertical. And then the horizontal the human human horizontal. relationship. Yeah. So when people say that all you need is to love God, and love your neighbor. I said, so what does it mean when to you love, love your neighbor, you, you mean you can go and take the wife? <laughs> or so are you saying the command? I don't, I don't understand. But basically, love is the centrality of the law of God because yeah. everything about God is about love. Yeah, but you see, the interesting thing is that when Christ even said, love God with your whole heart yeah. and love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. It wasn't anything new. He no. quoted scripture yes. from Deuteronomy. He quoted from Deuteronomy mm -hmm. and Leviticus. Exactly. So it was in it not anything new. No. Let's move on. And uh, I want us to share what is written in Christ's object lessons, page 39 and 40. 40. He, Christ, pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. And as Christians and as Bible-believing Christians, I just want to put the yeah. word Bible-believing Bible there. Bible-believing Christians, we cannot live without the Bible. We cannot live outside the scriptures. No. As you said earlier, whatever we say must come out of, out the, of scriptures. the scripture. And so, yes. as a follow up to what I said, if only we can study the pages of these holy scriptures, the more uh, I think our relationship with God would be more solidified, would have a closer work with Him, and would have better interpersonal relationships with our fellow man. And I want to, I want to emphasize here that we can have dreams, we can even see visions, but the primary source that God speaks to man is through the word, of God. the word of God. And whether you have a dream, whether you have visions, and they are not in conformity with the word of God, it's lie. And that's we have to note. Because somebody said that um, he had a dream, and in a dream he saw the, a dead ant. And uh, in a dream he was levigating, and he was speaking to the ant, and the ant said, what do you want here? He said, you two, what do you want here? And it's like they were, they were scared among oh. themselves and they started running away. <laughs> and he came back into his body. 
So because of this, he's saying that it means that when you die, you still continue to live. And he is so resolute on this dream that there is no way you can convince him that the dead is dead. Wow. Yeah, but can you imagine? Where, where, where is it based? Is it this, based in scripture? This is what I'm saying that, yes, you could have dreams. You could even see visions. But if these do not conform to the standard of scripture, it is false. See. We can't depend on dreams yes. and visions without reference okay. to the word of God. Certain right. so dreams as a result to, uh, of hunger. <laughs> or overeating and then you start seeing yourself levitating so we should guard against this all right now jesus and all scripture uh, if we turn to matthew listen we're going to look at luke chapter 24 luke, luke 24 and uh, let's see let's look at verse 13 and behold two of them went the same day to a village called emmaus which was from Jerusalem, about three score forlorns. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another mm -hmm. as ye walk? I and are sad. Okay. So. Now, here we, we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ right. after his resurrection. Uh, two of his disciples were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And Christ walks along with them. And Christ, seeing their demeanor, asked them what was happening. And they asked, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? You, you don't seem to know what has just happened. The interesting thing is this. All about Christ was in scripture. About the fact that Christ, the son of God, will come and live as man, suffer, die, but rise up again on the third day. And all these things have happened, but still the disciples didn't get it. And because they didn't get it, it was like they're living in the, outside the scriptures. And the Bible says Christ took them through scripture, beginning from Moses. Moses. What does it mean? Beginning from Genesis, Exodus, Exodus Leviticus, Leviticus Numbers, De Numbers, Deuteronomy, yeah. Joshua, all Judges, all the way through the prophets, yeah. you know, to, to the, through the law and to the prophets. Right. And telling them of all the, pro the prophecies concerning himself. And we also see that on two separate occasions, he explains how all has been fulfilled from the Old Testament prophecies. And he says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Now, again, when we look at verse 44 and 45, please, if you would go there. That's Luke the same Luke 24, verses 44 and 45. Um, verse, verse 44, and he said to them, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms yes. concerning me. So the, the available book to the, to the Jews or the Hebrews were the law. Yeah. That's uh, the, the first Torah. five books. Yeah. And then the Psalms. The Psalms. And, right. and then the prophets. The prophets, yeah. That is the, the entirety of scripture. Right. And he says, all scripture is given by inspiration. So all these books. And Christ didn't refer to anything outside these books. And so these are the books that we are supposed to also depend on, as Christ depended on. So Christ opened their eyes to see that he was the fulfillment of all the old Testament, of course, that was what was available to them then. Prophecies concerning him, his coming, his death, his rising again. And so the same way um, the manner of his kingdom eluded them and they thought it was a physical thing, that's the same way all these eluded them. And he quoted and took them carefully according to the account. Yes. And according to uh, the account here, it says, then their eyes were opened. Yes. Hallelujah. Now it says, by referring to the totality of scripture, Jesus is teaching the disciples by example. 
as they go forth to spread the gospel message, they too were to expound on all scripture, to bring understanding and power to the new converts throughout the world. Uh, you, you, you don't have a notion to choose what scripture you want to share with the people. God's word is one. And so, here a little and there a little. Line upon line. Precept line upon line. Upon precept, precept upon precept. Yeah. Yes. Now, let's look at Jesus and the origin and history of the Bible. Jesus taught that the Bible is the word of God in the sense that what it says is synonymous with what God says. Its origin is found in God and therefore contains ultimate authority for every aspect of life. God worked through history to reveal his will to humanity through the Bible. Now, for instance, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, Jesus refers to a quote by Moses. But Jesus takes this passage, passage and says, He who made them at the beginning said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother. Instead of saying, Scripture says, Jesus says, he who made them at the beginning said, attributing the creator's word, what the narrator of Genesis wrote. So God is, in fact, regarded here as the author of this statement, mm. even though it was written by Moses. Right. So it will mean that all scripture, even though they were written by men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, they are, in essence, God's word. God himself yeah. stating it. Okay. So you cannot uh, underrate and di discount any word in the scripture. No, we can't. Because these are words of God. Yes. And no man is wise as God. As God. And that means that no portion of scripture is faulty or fallible. Not at all. For everyone, all. every portion of scripture is authoritative and infallible word of God. Whenever we see a controversy, we need to humbly go down on knees and pray for understanding. understanding. For there is no controversy. And for enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. There yes. is no controversy. Yes. It is us. All right. Now, Jesus consistently treats Old Testament people, places and events as historical truth. He even refers to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Abel in Genesis 4. David eating the showbread and Elisha among the historical figures. Even like uh, no, uh, uh, no, no, the man in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the belly of the whale, Jonah. Jonah, Jonah. Yeah, people that. think it's a, it's, a, it's a fable or some kind of uh, somebody's imagination, but Christ even quotes it, yes, and that shows that prophecy. it is true. Classical, prophecy. yes, it's true. Okay, let's move on to the bio, the apostles and the Bible. Let's see how the apostles also treated the word of God. Now, the New Testament writers approach the Bible the same way as Jesus does. In matters of doctrine, ethics, and prophetic fulfillment, the Old Testament for them was the authoritative the word, word of God. God. In actual fact, that was all they had. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, that was all they had. Yeah. And uh, what they wrote were epistles and the gospel to add unto what was in existence. Right. And when even someone asked Christ, what shall I do to have eternal life? He referred the person to, to Old Testament. Right. Commandments. Yes. Now, let's look at uh, one or two passages here. Our time is running up. We have only two minutes left. Uh, if you look at Romans 9, verse 17. For want of time, we may not read it, but it says where one would expect God as the subject, when you read Romans 9, 17, Paul uses the term scripture, scripture instead of saying God. Now, saying, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, instead of saying for God said to the Pharaoh, he said for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, which could actually be stated for God says to the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, the, scripture, the, the subject scripture is used in place of God, showing just how closely tied the word of God is to God Himself. Amen. Yes. It's unfortunate we are running against time, so probably uh, we can go 
to the summary, to the end on Friday, and look at further thoughts. And they quickly go through the quotes over there. So, Elder, if you can take the first quote, and then after that, sister, you can also take the last quote, and we'll bring our studies to a close. Men consider themselves wiser than God, the word of God. Yes. Wiser even than God. And instead of planting their feet on the immovable foundation and bringing everything to the test of God's word, they test that word by their own ideas of science and nature. And if it seems not to agree with their scientific ideas, it is discarded as unworthy of credence. Mm. That is from Science of the Times, huh? yes. right. March 27, 1844. Okay, those who become best acquainted with the wisdom and purpose of God as revealed in his word become men and women of mental strength and they may become efficient workers with a great educator, Jesus Christ. Christ has given his people the words of truth and all are called to act as part in making them known to the world. There is no sanctification aside from the truth, the word, then how essential that it should be understood by everyone. Hallelujah. Amen. And you White, Fundamentals of Christian Education. Amen. So, we can say that, sola, we can say sola scriptura, that the word of God, the word alone, the word Jesus alone, authenticated it. That is it. Amen. May God bless us. Amen. And sanctify his word to our souls for his name's sake. Amen. Will you please build us? Let us pray. Thank you, everlasting Father, for revealing your will to us through the Holy Bible. Please help us to search the scriptures. Help us to live by the words in the scriptures, in the light of your word, because you will certainly shed your glory on our way. Thank you, dear Lord, for this lesson. Bless all those that are watching and are studying, and grant that your church be prepared for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we are prayed with thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. 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 Of a mighty rushing wind, and it's close enough than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet as came. Sounds the chord, and not the midnight cry. When Jesus comes again, when Jesus steps out on the clouds to call His children. Christ shall rise to meet him in the air, and then those that remain will be quickly changed, and not the midnight. When Jesus comes again I look around me I see prophecies Fulfilling Oh, and signs of the time See, they are appearing everywhere I can almost hear 
my Father. As he says, Son, go get my children, and not the midnight cry. The bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on the clouds to call his children the dead in Christ shall arise to meet him in the air and then those that remain children good morning to you and a happy sabbath we are very happy to be here to share the children's corner with you auntie uzoma yes, are you happy today yes please I'm yes so happy sabbath days we should be happy so children get ready sit down and let's sing that our favorite sabbath song the sabbath day is bright we go the sabbath day is bright is bright and fair, is bright and fair, is bright and fair. The Sabbath day is bright, is bright and fair. Oh, happy, oh, happy, oh, happy Sabbath day. Oh, happy, oh, happy, oh, happy Sabbath day. Good children, that was very nice. Now we are going to sing one of our favorite songs. Auntie, what is that song? Take a little step and jump to the corner. Wow. Children, are you ready? I think you need to stand. Get up, get up on your feet and let's sing the song. And make Auntie, sure we are ready. Jump. Yes, Good. Auntie, we are ready. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Tra la 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 la. Oh, clap your hands, stamp your feet, turn a little round, around, around. Oh, clap your hands, stamp your feet, turn a little round, around. We go again, children. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Take a little step and jump to the corner. Tra la 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 la. Oh, clap your hands, stamp your feet, turn a little round, around, around. Oh, clap your hands, stamp your feet. Turn a little round, around. Beautiful. Thank you, children. Now we're going to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Auntie, are you ready? Yes, Auntie, I'm ready. So let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. 
little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes. Yes, Jesus loves me. He loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves this heart of mine. Make it pure and holy thine. On the cross you died for me. I will love and live for thee. Yes. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. He loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good children, you've done very, very well. Now let's go to our story for today. Auntie, do you have your Bible? Yes, please. Auntie, I have my Bible. Can you please open to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 16? Hebrews, Hebrews 13. The 16. Verse 16. Children, take your Bibles. Take your Bibles and let's read together with Auntie Uzoma. Okay, children, are you ready? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 reads, But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Children, I'll read it again. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Auntie. You're welcome. Children, this morning, the title of our story is The Boy Who Picked a Doll. The Boy Who Picked a Doll. Is doll for boys? No. no. A boy should pick a toy like a, a football, a car. a car, an aeroplane, a train. Now, there were two children. They were orphans. I mean, they had no parents. The boy's name is Kofi, and the little sister was Ama. They were living outside. That means they sleep outside because they didn't have a home to stay in. Now, one day, there was a party, and the woman who was organizing the party decided to go and look for children to come and join in the party, auntie. When they went, when she went, she found Kofi and the sister and invited them to the party as well. Kofi went to the party, but left the sister at home because she was very little. When he got there, there were lots of food. Fried rice, jollof rice, banku, kenke, children name it. It was a lot. There were lots of drinks also. Bisap, uh, uh, pineapple juice. Kalipo. Kalipo was there. And they drank and drank and he ate and ate and his stomach was big. Now it was time for the children to pick the gifts for the day. So they've packed the toys for girls at the side and then toys for boys at the other end. Every child goes and pick what they like. Now it was Kofi's turn to go and pick the, 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 the gifts or the toy. And then he went to the lady's side, to the girl's side, and all the children said, like, oh, girly, 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 see the girly. He didn't talk. He was sad, though, because they were laughing at him. But he went there and he picked a little doll. And he kept it in his armpits like this and went home. When he got home, he gave the little doll to his the sister. sister. And the sister was so happy. happy. The sister was so happy. Now the woman that invited Kofi to the party 
went down to where they normally stay and asked him, Kofi, come, come. But why did you pick a doll when you were to pick your gift? And then he said, Auntie, you know, when I came to the party, I ate a lot of food and my sister didn't get anything. So I wanted to share in the joy that I have had. That is why I picked the doll for my little sister. Oh, yes, children. We need to be kind. We need to be kind to one another. When we do that, Jesus is happy. Kofi shared the happiness with the sister who couldn't attend the party. We children also have to do that. We have to be kind to one another. When we go to school, we have to be kind. At church, wherever we are, we need to be kind and learn to share. That is the end of our story today, children. We hope you have enjoyed it and you are at home keeping safe and washing your hands all the time. we we'll see you again next Sabbath. Auntie, what do we say? Bye-bye. Can we all have attention here? Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we come to the service, we ask for your leadership. We ask for your direction. We ask for your sustaining grace. We ask that you hold our mind hostage to the authority of your word. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, and exalted. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, and be heard. Not I, but Christ. In every look and action, not I, but Christ. In every thought and word, in Jesus' name, amen. As I always do, it was Jesus himself who said, If you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son set you free, you will be free indeed. Can you say an amen out there? I want to make to you four promises. Promise number one is the Bible is going to be the bedrock of our study. And the reason is the Bible means what it says and says just what it means. Promise number two, you are going to be enlightened irrespective of who you are. Promise number three, you are going to be challenged to make the most important decision of your life. And promise number four, your life and mine will never be the same. I want to invite you to a five-part series, homily. A homily means uh, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual spiritual sermon that is very concise. It's like a glucose. So this Sabbath morning, I want you to just prepare your heart in a short moment that God will speak to you, and I pray that you pray also that he does same for me. We're going to run a five-part series with title, While We Wait. While We Wait. So basically, we're going to look at while we wait, let us work. While we wait, let us walk. While we wait, let us warn. While we wait, let us watch. And while we wait, let us win. So you work, then you will walk. Then you will watch, and then you will warn, and then lastly you will win. So basically, this is what we will be dealing with as a means of introduction. When you look at the world, the world is filled with a lot of waiting, waiting seasons. We have a pregnant woman who wait for nine months to have the baby. A baby will wait to walk and talk. Then you watch young couples need to wait before they get married. When they get married, they need to wait for them to give birth. Life is filled with waiting. A farmer must wait for his produce to be produced. You get the point. So there is, from the period of planting to the period of harvest, it's a waiting period. The Christian journey is also a waiting period. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, he said, wait for me. I will come again. Our Christian experience is an experience of waiting. Everyone is waiting for COVID-19 to be over. Life is filled with waiting. Either a believer, a non-believer, there is that trajectory every one of us will take once upon a time is the trajectory of waiting. 
So you read the Bible, there is a lot of weight in the Bible. Genesis 4 verse 7, the Bible says, Sin is waiting at your doorstep. Genesis 8 verse 10, and after waiting another seven days, there is a lot of waiting. They that wait upon the Lord. You go to the book of James chapter 5 verse 7 and verse 8. The farmer waits for the precious produce, waiting for the glorious appearing of our great God. Wait, wait. So this five-part serial, whilst we wait. So for today, we will deal with the working component of waiting. Permit me to state, the work of the church is the same work of Christ. Did you get that? What Christ does as a work is what the church must do at her work. So we say the church as the body of Christ has the same work as Christ. The work of Christ must be the work of the church. So what is the work of Christ? The book of Luke chapter 19 verse 10. Jesus says, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. When Jesus was leaving the earth, he gave a gospel commission. The gospel commission says in Matthew 28 from verse 18, verse 19, verse 20, go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples of every creature, baptize them, teach them to observe all things. I am with you always. The gospel commission is framed on the component of discipleship. The, 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 the mandatory statement of the gospel commission is not go and preach, it's to make disciples. The reason why the church is not able to do her mandated work is that the members all of us, myself inclusive, we do not know what it is to be a disciple. Ellen White made a statement, and I quote, Christ, Christian service, page 10. To everyone, work has been allotted. And no one can be a substitute for another. Did you get that? Everyone, work has been allotted. In other words, you have the ability, you have the mandatory allotted and cut at work for you to do. And Ellen White says, no one can be a substitute. Every soul whom Christ has rescued is called to work in his name for the saving of others. Our theme for this morning is, while we wait, let us work. What is that work? It's the work of making disciples. Christian service page 9. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. The reason why we cannot do missions my brothers and sisters, is we do not understand what it is to be a disciple. So take your Bibles, and I want you to follow me. To, 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 for us to get to the book, the, the gospel, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look at a very critical component of the gospel today in the book of Matthew. Specifically, I'm referring to chapter 16. But before we read from verse 24, the Seventh-day Adventist Church's mission is basically the purpose for which Christ established the Christian church. And I read, the Seventh-day Adventist Church mission says, Make disciples of Jesus Christ who live in loving witness and proclaim to all people the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages in preparation for his soon return as they wait for his soon return. The church exists to make disciples. Question, who is a disciple? What are the characteristics of a disciple? I'm going to share with you. Four basic characteristics of a disciple that will, that, that will explain why the church is not working. Why we as church members, we are in a state of quagma, a state of indolence, a state of recklessness and carelessness. We, we, we're going to look at while we wait, let us work. In the midst of this COVID-19, it's not just a season to wake up in the morning and just to, to do our normal work. Those of us who work from home, it, it, it can't just be normal. A certain work must be done. Permit me to state, I said it here before. In the New Testament, they mentioned the word believer three times. They mentioned the word disciples 269 times. The work of the church is not to make believers. The work of the church is to make disciples. But what is it? What will it take to make a disciple? Listen to Jesus. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You have no idea. This is pregnant with meaning. Let me read it again. Jesus said to his disciples, listen carefully. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The first point is, what are the conditions of a disciple? Disciples are those who go to make other disciples. The reason we exist as a church, as a people, is to make disciples the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So what are the conditions of a disciple? If we know the conditions of a disciple, we will know what it takes, what it must take, what is required to do the work whilst we wait. Look at the first part. If any man desires to come after me, Jesus is saying, discipleship is a call for decision. Did you get that? Discipleship is a call for decision. In other words, a disciple is called to move on something. You need to decide. Many of us are not able to do the work of soul winning. We are not able to represent Christ aright. We are not able to do what God desires. Reason. We have not decided. That decision is not made. We have not decided that we want to be missionaries. We want to do God's will. We want to seek. We want to save that which is lost. A disciple must decide. To decide means you have made a conscious choice. You have agreed on some terms. You have committed to something. If any man wants to be my disciple or wants to follow me, let him decide. You need to decide. I can't tell. What decisions you have made? Have you made a decision? A disciple must decide. That takes me to point number two. Jesus says, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. So the second point of a disciple, number one, a disciple must decide. Number two, a disciple must deny. It's a life of denial. Denying oneself of luxury, even necessities of life. Denying oneself is entirely, is entirely a different ball game. It is, it, it's, it is born out of a decision. So if you decide to follow the Lord, you must be willing to deny yourself. So to put it quite candidly, denying oneself means that you, we, we, you renounce our rights of ourselves. The right to rule over our own life. The right, you, you completely disown yourself. In other words, you, you, you flesh out the self out of you. You are willing to be, to be demeaned on account of the choices you have made. You disown, you separate yourself. You have denied yourself. Peter uses the, the same word is used for Peter in Matthew chapter 26 from verse 34. When Peter says he denied Jesus, he denied him with a curse. You, you read Matthew 26 verse 34, verse 70, verse 72, verse 74. Peter denied himself. I don't know him. I, he denied himself. It's the same root word. Discipleship is to disown oneself. So point number one, if you want to be a disciple indeed, to do the work God has aligned us to do. You must, number one, you just don't deny yourself. You must be willing to decide. After you've decided, then you deny yourself. And after you've denied yourself, look at the next phrase. Jesus says, if any man desire to come after me, let him take up his cross. And that is, a disciple must be ready to die. You see, the cross is not just a symbol of shame. The cross is not just a, a, a symbol of, of neglect. It's not a symbol of demean status. The cross means it, it's, it's a contract of death. If you want to follow me, Jesus, say, carry your cross. It's not just to suffer for employment problem, to be neglected by family. That is not it. It's a call to die. So disciples, they decide, they deny, and they are ready to die. Die for what they are convinced about. Die for the cause for which they are called. The cross is not just a place of suffering. It is a place to die. It is a place to give up oneself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to die. Discipleship is a call to die. 
Christ himself die. It reminds me of the song, On the Hills Far Away. The author says, on the hills far away stood an old ragged the emblem of shame. But more than that, it is a symbol of death. Discipleship is about dying. Lastly, when God calls us to be disciples, it's a call to change our direction. Jesus says, if any man desire to come after me, let him follow me. Follow me means let him change his course of direction. Change your course of direction. In other words, if you are going to the left and you have decided to follow me, number one, you have denied yourself, number two, you have died to yourself, number three, and then number four, your course of direction will change. For lack of those four Ds, the church is in a state of ineptitude. The church is weak. The church is not able to carry out her mission. Everyone called into the kingdom of God to do God's will. We are not able to do. The world is unaware. Even in the midst of COVID-19, less is being done. We are believers. We are church members. But we are not disciples. Let me read some comment from Ellen Y. Ellen Y made some staggering statement regarding this concept. Regarding what is expected of a disciple. She says, the reason why the work is not being done. Are you aware that after 132 years in this country, literally, we are just less than half a million people, including children, pulled together? We are less than one million people. Those who are baptized, about 400 and something thousand. The work is not being done. Ellen White says, the true missionary spirit has deserted the church. I'm quoting testimony for the church's volume 4, page 156. The true missionary spirit has deserted the church. That makes so exalted a profession. Their hearts are no longer aglow with love for souls and a desire to lead them into the fold of Christ. We want earnest workers. Are there none to respond to the cry that goes up from every quarter? Come over to help us. We lack that spirit. There has been but little of the missionary spirit among Sabbath-keeping Adventists. If ministers and people were sufficiently aroused, they would not rest thus indifferently, whilst God has honored them by making them the, the, the depositories of his law, by printing it in their minds and writing it upon their heart. We are just not interested. Our faith is not in tandem with that of Christ. I was shown, Testimony for the Churches, Volume 2, page 114. I was shown that as a people, we are deficient. Our faiths are not in accordance with our, our works are not in accordance with our faith. Our faith testified that we are living under the proclamation of the most solemn, important message that was ever given mortals. Yet in full view of this fact, our effort our zeal, our spirit of self-sacrifice do not compare with the characters of the work. We should awake from the dead and Christ will give us his life. Lastly, we are not able to do the work whilst we wait because we have withheld ourselves. I'm quoting from the book, the General Conference Bulletin, 1893, page 131. My heart is pained when I think how little our churches sends their solemn, ac solemn accountabilities to God. It is not ministers alone who are, who are soldiers, but every man and woman who has enlisted in Christ's army. And are they willing to receive a soldier's fare just as Christ has given them an example in his life of self-denial and sacrifice? What self-denial have our churches as a whole manifested? They may have given donations in money, but have withheld themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, today, let us decide. Today, let us deny ourselves. Today, let us be ready to die. And today, let us change our course of action. I want us to sing this simple song, which happened to be our theme song we are going to be using. I want us to sing hymn number 375 to depict the work that we need to be doing while we wait. Hymn 375. And for the night is coming. Join us. Let's go. Work for the night is
brothers and sisters, we are not in normal times. The scripture says, if we want to do the work of discipleship, let us decide. Let us deny. Let us be ready to die. And lastly, let us change our course of action. May God help us. Before I pray, listen to this quote. To me, it sums up the thought pattern of whilst we wait, let us work. He was a young man, very young in his age. He made a compelling statement regarding the need to give one's all. His name, William Booth. He says, Your Majesty, some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is fame. Some men's ambition is gold. My ambition is the soul of man. While we wait, let us work. Father in heaven, we thank you for this simple homily. A message that will remind us to step up our game and not to sit on our oars, to do something with our lives. I pray for myself and I pray for every PESDAC member, everyone who is watching. When by your grace, these lockdowns are over. May we be ready to give our all. Yea, even whilst we are still home, we are waiting for this lockdown to be over. Whilst we are waiting for your soon return, may we give mission our all. May we give discipleship our all. May we give it our all because that is the mandate. May the Lord bless us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us for our online service. We are pleased that you had time to share the day with us. We employ you to continue to subscribe to our channel. Tell others that God loves them. Share the light that you have received. Bless someone. Even in this period where we are locked down, Christ is not locked down in our hearts. God bless you. Shall we share the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.